Hey, I want to welcome you to our panel today. Uh, we have three uh, very interesting guests, and we're going to talk about religious liberty in Australia and elsewhere in the world. And so I'd like to just jump straight in. Let's have each of our three guests get just a brief introduction, who you are, where you're from, and uh, we'll leap into the program. Why don't we start with you, Daniel? Okay. Uh, thank you for having me, Larry. Uh, my name is Daniel Ma. Um, I'm a pastor here in uh, Victoria, Australia, uh, which is kind of center of, I guess, where things are happening. Um, so yeah, I guess I'm just here as, as someone that is affected, although maybe we'll hear more about that as to who else might be affected as well. Jonathan. Yes, uh, I'm Jonathan Zirkel. I'm a trial attorney. Um, recently, I've been doing a lot of work in the religious liberty area. I've been doing a lot with the COVID vaccine and the mandates, and I've also had a significant amount of experience doing religious liberty issues in the workplace. Um, but <clears throat> I view myself as primarily a trial attorney. Uh, Wayne Blakely from Washington State, uh, director of Know His Love Ministries, which is a ministry about redemption from homosexuality for those who are seeking to escape the LGBT plus culture and also directed towards leadership in our denomination today about the clarity of uh, homosexuality and scripture. Okay, and I am Pastor Larry Kirkpatrick. I serve as a pastor up here and. Uh, Michigan Conference, so we're scattered across the land. You know, I, I would just want to say to anyone that's watching this that none of us four um, don't like you. Uh, we all, if we meet meet you, we want to we want to love you. We want to get to know you. And uh, this video is not supposed to be negative. We're just having a conversation about what uh, some new laws in Victoria, what implications they might have for all of us, for you as well as for us. And so I, I encourage you to watch this video uh, with an open mind. And uh, if you have any concerns about anything that we've said, please feel free to contact us. So we have a little clip we want to show you. It's going to take uh, about a minute and a half or two minutes. This is uh, particular to Australia, particular to the Victoria, the state of Victoria in Australia. But uh, maybe Pastor Daniel can tell us uh, more how it might broadly affect us. But let's, let's take a quick look at that and then we'll carry right on. It says that this is the thing that is prohibited. Change or suppression practice means conduct directed towards a person, whether with or without the person's consent, on the basis of the person's sexual orientation or gender identity, and for the purpose of changing or suppressing the sexual orientation or gender identity of the person, or inducing, you know, that is encouraging, uh, the person to change or suppress their sexual orientation or gender identity. It then includes a list of specific examples, one of which is, quote, prayer-based practice. I think it's the only act, uh, perhaps in the Western world, where prayer is listed as a possible criminal offence. Um, you see how the Human Rights Commission's examples now fit. Let's take the one of the religious leader in a meeting with the same-sex attracted person. That is conduct directed towards a person, tick. Uh, and then it says pressuring, or even if we just say encouraging, which is more likely, pressuring is a little less, encouraging a person to ignore their feelings of same-sex attraction and practice celibacy. Well, is that conduct for the purpose of inducing the person to change or suppress their sexual orientation or gender identity? Under the terms of the Act, it sure is. It sure is. And note, it matters not whether this is voluntary, whether the meeting was requested, whether the question is asked. Let's lower the threshold on another one of those examples. Let's say that we're not talking about excommunication. Let's say something more likely. So uh, I, I don't know that there's much of what I've described going on anywhere, but let's take, uh, for example, putting somebody out of the worship team or removing them from eldership in the church, you know, some kind of ministry role due to same sex relationship. Now, that would be perfectly commonplace, I imagine, in many churches because it would not meet the church's requirement for serving in ministry. Is it illegal? I honestly can't see how it would not be. It is conduct directed at a person on the basis of sexual orientation for the purposes of inducing them to suppress or change. At least if asking them not to come back to church qualifies, then I think that it would be likely that this also qualifies to ask them to step down from this role. It would surely be similar. In fact, here's the interesting thing. You can workshop so many examples in this and it's alarming where it goes. Encouraging a single straight male to be celibate would theoretically be illegal under the act because that is inducing him, a straight male, on the basis of his singleness, it's inducing him to suppress his sexual orientation under the definitions in the Act. So Daniel, uh, what I'm hearing here, it sounds like there's a new law uh, that's been put in place. Uh, this law makes uh, it 
so that if somebody even comes to you and they want to talk to you about maybe they feel like same-sex attraction is an issue that they don't feel comfortable with, but they feel like they're experiencing it, but they think it might be wrong and they come to you as a pastor, uh, this law appears, uh, appears that it would potentially affect affect you, whether you're actually a pastor, or even if you're the parent of some atheist parent of a child that wants to uh, supposedly transition their gender from one to the other. Uh, are we reading it right? Because I looked at some stuff on the website, and I'll put some of it up here on the screen in between as we talk. I was quite surprised to see uh, how plain and boldly it is right out there in the front, uh, things that are considered to be, uh, that they would be unacceptable. Uh, small group meeting where somebody uh, might uh, pray with somebody. Uh, am, are we understanding this right or are we overreacting? Well, that, that's a good question, Larry. Uh, and I guess the short answer is we don't know yet. Um, so this is, as you said, a new law, very new. Uh, it hasn't been tested yet in court. Until it's been tested in court, we don't really know how the court system is going to interpret it. Um, I think Jonathan will probably be able to talk more to that. Um, but I guess what I would want to add there is um, to, to what was said in the video that this isn't just something that affects me. In fact, it may affect me less than someone like, for example, uh, Wayne, um, because the law doesn't necessarily have geographical boundaries. Um, it's, it's supposed to apply anywhere. Um, that is to say, uh, it applies to the people of Victoria, but if anyone anywhere could be considered to be in, uh, in contravention um, of this law, just because you know, live in Victoria doesn't mean that you're necessarily protected. Once again, I, I'm not a lawyer and it hasn't been tested in court, um, but that seems to be the intention of the law to, to make a um, absolutely broad brush um, threat, at least, against people that would, would seek to uh, encourage someone to change from their current orientation. So, Jonathan, just because there seem to be a lot more questions these days in terms of what is and what is not a religious liberty issue, maybe we, I mean, it seems obvious to me this is, but maybe we should check in with you. Um, is the kind of thing that uh, Pastor, Pastor Daniel is describing, is that a religious, potentially a religious liberty issue, or is this just like a public health issue we can all just um, take a nap? Well, I think it's certainly a religious liberty issue. You know, the, the, the litmus test for whether something is religious liberty or not is, does it affect your religious practices or your beliefs? Is it somehow related to your conscience? And um, all of this is, you know, uh, most religious traditions, certainly Christianity, it has a long history of having opinions and things to say about these very issues. And it's explicitly in the Bible um, I, I don't think anyone would have a, an easy time of arguing that there's no religious liberty implication here. Wayne, uh, uh, Pastor Daniel said this might actually affect someone uh, with your background or your, your purpose, perhaps even more than it might even affect a pastor, um, since your main uh, work right now is to minister to people and try to be a help to them and maybe coming 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 in a large shift from, from one worldview or one place of practice and human sexuality to another. Um, when you think about this law that they now have, that's a legal issue in, in Australia, uh, what is your thoughts about that in terms of your work? Do you think that you could uh, go to the city of Victoria, if you could travel there and get there and hold a big meeting? Do you think that uh, that would be something that would be doable? Or do you think that that would have to be something you'd have to do in the back alley in that city? Well, I think that, you know, the back alley or somebody's home is, is going to be probably a precedent that gets set at some point. It, it will have to be uh, tested at some point. It will be somebody like myself or somebody who's bold enough um, to test it. And it will also be an LGBT um, uh, militant activist that will that will take it to the test. So usually find an attorney if they think the circumstances are are you know well enough that are, are going to es escalate and bring visual visualization to the case and they have a strong case, uh, then then it, it will get tested. It's just as in in Canada there were tests um, because they have the laws up there even prior to the C four bill where somebody uh, was refusing to call someone by the gender that
I did serve jail time over it. Um, religious liberty is being threatened, and I have to immediately come back to Paul, um, who was, you know, moving forward with the gospel, but was having to share some of that gospel behind bars and in a few places. And, you know, God has promised us that, you know, our bread and water would be sure and that he will take care of us. So um, I think, yes, it will be, it'll be interesting how it plays out. If there will be people who, because of the narrowing of the scheme of things in time, that maybe there will be more within the LGBT community that are seeing, Hey, you know, I really do want to pay attention to what the what Christ is offering me and asking, what does Christ offer me? Because today it's so difficult to get onto a university campus to share this. I have pastors asking me today, Wayne, do you know of any young people that speak on this like you do? And I was like, okay, I guess it's time that I recognize I've crossed over the bridge. And I said, you know, I really don't. But I said, do you know why? I said, let me tell you we can't get onto campuses to share this redemptive restorative message. And so there are many people identifying as LGBT that they don't even know that there's a way out or what that way out looks like. So it it is a huge test. It's been, we've been coming up to this precipice and and now laws are being passed. We have 20 uh, in 20 States of the United States um, counseling someone about homosexuality that is under the age of 18 is illegal and in a hundred municipalities. Would it be easier for you to get uh, onto a Christian campus or a secular campus? A public campus with a Christian club is easier this day. So we went, a colleague of mine and I went, uh, it's probably been five years ago, we went to Ohio State and there were flyers put out about it at all, and people showed up who wanted to be there, and there was no backlash. There was nobody saying that we shouldn't be there. Um, and so that was peculiar because we it, we couldn't have the same happen uh, if we were to do that going on to an Adventist University campus. So let me come back around. Uh, Jonathan, you were – I wonder if this is going to it, – it sounds like from what, what – uh, Wayne is saying is that this stuff is is coming to America. Uh, you know, it, may, it might be more severe at the moment in Australia, but this isn't something that we're going to be able to watch from the horizon and just um, say, "Wow, that was pretty strange," and watch it go by. It, it sounds like it's going to come right right up to our doorstep. Well, it, it's certainly happening. Um, you certainly see it going on in the press. Um, it's a little bit hard to say. the The whole scheme of freedom of speech in Australia and Canada and around the world is, is quite a bit different than the way it's been uh, developed here in America. And so um, I'm not sure. Uh, one of the other things that's been pretty effective though here in the United States is the cancel culture and going ahead and canceling you out of everything like YouTube and, and um, even perhaps the, the credit card system and the banking system. And so while we may not be headed for a criminal sanction right away, um, it's something that we certainly have to watch out for and we shouldn't take it for granted that there aren't a whole lot of other ways that they can make life pretty difficult um, with what we see going on right now. And I think I read it on the Victoria government website uh, that they actually were going around to churches in Victoria. There was a group of these uh, government officials, I take it, going around to churches in Australia and, and uh, showing up uh, and sitting through the worship service and making their presence known. And I'm sure they were scanning for any potential violations of what they would think their their laws was going to be or, or already is. It would be interesting to have five or six of these guys show up at your church. I think our inclination would suddenly would be to just be friendly like we would be with everybody. But I think if you had six lawyers or activists on the front row of your church and you were going to preach from certain parts of the Bible, I, don't, I, I wonder if some of us might begin to feel nervous and less sure that we are going to present the message we were going to present, or if we would uh, go and try to back off under the pew and be and try to make friends or something. Not, we're not trying not to be friends. I don't know, Pastor Daniel, what do you think? Um, if they- yeah, yeah, yeah I, I'd love to respond to that. I, look, I think it's so important for us. Um, whether we're pastors or not, when, when we're preaching or when we're sharing with someone, we shouldn't assume, you know, we shouldn't assume uh, that the person that we're talking to is not a, a militant activist that's trying to take us down. And we shouldn't assume that, that even someone like that doesn't need to hear the gospel. So I, I think we, 
it's it's definitely something that makes us nervous when we hear about these kinds of changes. This, I, I don't know, um, you know, how much you know about Victoria and um, of all the states of Australia, Victoria is probably, at least at the moment, uh, the most progressive uh, in this kind of way. Progressive, I don't know if that's the right word, but... Um, and yeah, Australia is more like Canada rather than the United States in, in terms of our attitude towards freedom. Um, but, you know, so this is just one of many, uh, many laws that limit what we would be able to do and say um, in our everyday lives. And I don't like it. Um, I wish we had more freedom. Uh, I think that's something that as Adventists we should advocate for. And I appreciate you know, people like Jonathan who advocate for religious freedom. I, I wish we had more of that here. Um, but at the end of the day, um, we've got to be willing to say what is true. And speaking the truth in love shouldn't, you know, maybe someone might be able to twist our words such that we might get in trouble with this law. But um, I think we can get around it and still express the truth. But the issue is just that, you know, nobody really wanted to do anything. This, the, the law was for no reason. No one was going out there trying to force uh, people to change their orientation. Um, as far as I'm aware, there's been very little evidence presented or even opportunity for people to ask why the need for this law. It just seems to be a, a bit of a, you know, thumbing the nose of the Christian community. That, that's just the way that I see it. It seems like there's a lot of lobby lobbying on one line and zero lobbying on the other line. I don't know. Yeah, well, it's just a matter of listening, We're, you know, the Christian communities and, and people, you know, faith, freedom for faith, people are working hard. You know, we have one of our um, uh, administrators here in, in Australia that is working hard um, to try to, you know, stand up for freedom. But it's just some are just not listening because they, they perhaps believe that they have no chance of ever getting our votes anyway. And so they just, you know, don't listen. And that's not true. Um, you know, our church is not uh, partisan. We, we don't vote for one side of politics or the other, um, particularly predominantly. You know, I know people in our church that are on both sides of the political aisle, and I, I think it's the same all over the world. Um, so it's a bit of a pity that people are not, um, not more willing to listen to our concerns. Um, but, you know, maybe, maybe that will change in the future and maybe not. Well, let me pose a question from one of the one of the things that was on the government website, and of each of you comment on it. One of the things that I read was about because uh, they give specific kinds of examples of things that would that they were stating would be not legal. This would be outlawed things to do, and one of the things was like in a uh, small group setting. Um, if somebody wanted to talk to you about uh, potentially they have the same sex attraction, they feel uncomfortable with it, they're not sure what to do with it, they approach you. You didn't approach them. They even approached you and you were to suggest they should be go along with whatever they were, the, the DNA they were born with and sort of stick with that. Uh, that's biological sex in, in every respect, that that would be basically against the law. Another one was uh, if you were a parent and you had a child and your child is perhaps uh, in his or, his or her early teens and they decide they, they somehow identify with the opposite sex, if you deny that child, um, so maybe it's a member of your church, a family in your church, and that child wants to uh, become the other sex, uh, if you were to try to speak with that person, pray with that person, suggest maybe to hold off on this dramatic uh, adventure or misadventure that that they should stop that would be the kind of thing that might be also actually outlawed in that place i'm wondering what each one of us each one of you might comment about that i think you you've got a number of concerns there one is that as a pastor or or just as another christian you've got to be very careful about anybody um, who approaches you that wants to talk about this subject um, and this really has a chilling effect on, on religious speech. And the other problem that I see is that even with people who maybe come with you sincerely uh, looking for help, um, they may vacillate. They may go forward and backwards. And at some point, they may be calling the police in on you. Um, but, you know, one of the things that I think is important to think about, and this is starting to happen in the United States, too, I, I think, I sense it. Uh, happening on some issues, and that is 
not so much whether they're going to enforce this particular law against you, but you may find yourself in a situation where there's a custody battle for a child. And um, one parent may be trying to help the child through um, some issue with homosexuality. The other parent may be encouraging the homosexuality. And um, they will use a law like this to show which parent is right and which parent is wrong. And you can find the uh, conservative Christian parent losing custody um, because of this kind of thing. And, and these sorts of battles, these sorts of issues are already coming up in the American courts, even without the law uh, of, this, uh, of this nature. But I think in a place where you have a law like that, you have a really, a really tough road to hoe. And, and you might even find a situation where CPS is coming in. Uh, I don't know what they would call it in Australia, but that would be Child Protective Services here in the U.S. They might be coming in and trying to use that law to take away custody of your child. And, and then, you know, if you've got your child at school and the school is encouraging him or her to take this kind of approach, um, you can see where this quickly can spin out of control. The groundwork is already being laid. I think there's more advances than than we than some may recognize as it relates to in the U.S. on the on this topic. So the Equality Act, um, which is just waiting in the wings to be put through, um, it's made it through the House of Representatives. Uh, Joe Biden said to the LGBT community before he was even elected, "I promise you, I will get this thing passed in the State of, a, of the Union." address a couple of weeks ago. Um, he called upon um, uh, the, you know, everyone there, let's, it, let's, get, uh, let's get this Equality Act passed to get LGBT people their rights. Um, we have a, a militant LGBT activist, um, uh, Sam Brinton, uh, who works with the Trevor Project. The Trevor Project flags everything on YouTube that suggests that someone is being converted that can be converted in a secular way to leave homosexuality for a life of heterosexuality or for somebody who is seeking to leave uh, the LGBT culture to be converted to a Christ-like um, ideation or principles uh, from scripture. And so Sam Brenton says, I'm looking to take the, to criminalize conversion therapy and to take the licenses away from uh, psychologists who practice this, I, I can't find every little pastor, he says, but if I can get it uh, criminalized through the, through the APA, which is the American Psychiatric Association, if I can get it criminalized there, and then I don't have to worry about the pastors because that'll just fall in suit, that'll fall in place. Um, and so there's... The, and then the bills, like I mentioned, that had that already in the 20 states of the U.S. that for minors can't even go and seek to talk to somebody about wanting to live out in a way that would be contrary to how they feel. And, and so today you get the definition of conversion therapy is being broadly put out there. You'll get one definition from, from the dictionary and then whatever else the LGBT community wants to add to it. And this includes somebody who will voluntarily go seek for help um, in this way. And so it would actually become criminal for an LGBT person to leave the LGBT culture. So, yeah, I was looking at, and it seems to me that these definitions for conversion in the Australian law, reparative therapy, or, or it seems like these definitions, and, and uh, correct me, but it seems like these are very vague, they're very loose, uh, if the definition is so elastic that you can read into it uh, colorful legal ideas, uh, isn't that really making the laws more of a trap than it is a, a protector of rights? It seemed to me that the, uh, the definitions here, definitions would be of uh, dramatic significance in a legal matter, but it seems like the definitions in these kind of things are, are very loose. And that may mean that, you know, Twitter and, and different big tech uh, social media platforms have a lot more freedom to, you know, dump, cancel anybody they want. Uh, but legally, legally, it would seem to me that it's dangerous to have these, these hyper elastic definitions. So it plays into two things. It plays into human rights 
and it plays into religious rights. So it's taking away your freedom to choose even just as a human being. And secondly, it will, it will mess with people on the, on the, on the religious level who are seeking to, to go and to live in agreement with scripture. Daniel, I don't know if what you have, uh, but I don't, in the U S there is no accreditation for somebody who, who would do conversion therapy. You know, there's no federal state or, or college license or certificate that you would get to call yourself a conversion therapist. It's not on a, it's not on a shingle that a psychologist hangs out their door. No, no, I, um, you certainly, I don't even know if it was legal before to be a conversion therapist in, in Victoria, at least. Um, certainly there was no um, official sanction for it. And, and really there's been very few instances where people have in, a, in Australia have made that their ministry. Um, I suspect that what you do is probably completely harmless. Um, I know that there has been some harmful forms of, of conversion in the, in the dim past, you know, or whatever. I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure some of that's been exaggerated too. But to, to answer your question, Larry, I, I think it's the, inter- the example that uh, Martin Niles gave at the end was very instructive, which was that actually the, the law could be stretched um, like, like you were saying, the law could be stretched to apply to a, a, a heterosexual person uh, that they might be feeling an urge to be promiscuous and then uh, the law might also prevent you from being able to encourage them to be celibate or to be uh, abstinent or whatever. It just, it is, it does seem like a bit of a over-the-top law in terms of what it could potentially do. And I do suspect that the uh, courts will probably um, put a few boundaries on it. But to me, it, it doesn't really matter if the law doesn't actually send a lot of people to jail, which I suspect it won't. Um, what matters to me is that the people of Victoria couldn't care less. <laughs> they really don't care that uh, there's, these laws are being made and they don't care that people are not going to be able to get uh, services or you know, uh, spiritual guidance that they want um, and because it will be criminalised. And the fact that people don't care about that, to me, that's the big problem. Uh, the big problem to me is not the law, it's the culture. The culture that says this is totally okay. It's totally okay for you to lock people into whatever their, their current feelings are and to stop people by force of law, you know, by prison and police and, and all the rest of it, um, even if it's just the threat of police, to stop people from being able to willingly help each other. That seems really, it's really disappointing, to be honest. I, I, you know, I've, I've lived in Victoria most of my life. I grew up here. And I just, I never would have believed how, how little people care about freedom, you know, that people are willing to throw it away. And I don't really understand why. I don't, I don't see the reason or the justification for this. I think people are just a bit asleep at the wheel. Jonathan, um, when we, we're hearing what Pastor Daniel is saying um, about a significant percentage of people in the culture, I'm, not, I'm sure not just there, but all around us, uh, really don't perhaps care or don't really know enough about liberty to care. It doesn't sound like it's a theory. It sounds like we're in the process of Christianity being recriminalized. I mean, at the beginning, it was sort of not legal. And now coming down the hill on the other side, it seems like Christianity maybe is in the process of being, in a sense, if I could say it, recriminalized. Uh, You'd think there would be barriers, constitutional barriers. But if the culture is indifferent, uh, will the law help us? Well, the thing is, is that if, when you live in a democracy or even a republic, as, as we are technically a republic, a, a democratic republic, it's really never any better than the sum total of the people that are doing the voting. Our founding fathers in America recognized that. And they said that a democracy was completely unfit. In fact, it, it, and they were already, it was already a republic. They're not talking about true democracy. A republic a democratic republic, the peop- it's completely unfit to govern a people that is not moral. And so um, we, can, we can praise democracy as much as we want, but if the society has gone immoral, then uh, democracy probably is not going to be the answer. Uh, really, no form of government is going to be the answer in that scenario. And if you look at the history of the world, um, 
uh, freedom is really the exception and not the rule. Um, there's never been generalized freedom anywhere until the last uh, 200 years or so of, of history of the world. And so this is a very unique time and it's very fragile and I expect we're gonna see it disappear. Let's kind of shift gears a little bit as we're kind of winding towards the end here of our talk, uh, looking to the future, the present and the future. I, I'm not sure how long the future is going to be at this point. It might not be so much so lengthy. From this standpoint, looking at us, we're all looking at this from our three different, our four different perspectives here. What, what does the church need to do now to be ahead of the game instead of behind it? If, if the culture is flattening out morally, if the, the laws aren't going to, the guarantees we've sort of grew up ex anticipating uh, don't pan out because the culture is, is losing its way morally, uh, then how can the church, what does the church need to do at this point to continue to be faithful or to be more faithful than we've been? Do you think some people are going to need to go to jail or be willing to be canceled? If people come and pick it in front of my church, uh, and bring cameras and, and make videos and live stream that they're picketing some terrible atrocity I've done against LGBTQ and the other letters people. Should, should, we, should we all just go outside and apologize to them and, and hide behind the bushes? Or, or what, what, what's the kind of approach the church needs to take today so that we are not um, the tail in this? And we, we, are, we, we have a message. The gospel message is for everybody and we can't just say, well, I'm not going to deliver the gospel message to you because uh, you might sue me. Or I'm not going to deliver the gospel message to you because you'll make a video against me. Um, what can the church do going into the future? And the future is coming at us very rapidly uh, because it seems like the, the laws are, are making it impossible even for somebody like uh, Brother Wayne to, uh, to, to present a, an alternative case for, for a, a different lifestyle because the, the lifestyle that we're all talking about is becoming criminalized. I don't, I don't know if I'm overstating that. I, I sort of don't think I am. So this has become an area of particular focus of mine, in the, particularly in the last four months. Um, there's a lot outside of Adventism that's actually going on. There's a huge awareness of what's going on in other ex-gay ministries that I've been interviewing over the last four months. Uh, people, groups of people who have been on the steps of the Capitol in California, who've also been on the steps of the Capitol in Washington, D.C., who are making cases for, let's, let's say there's a, um, a girl who's 16 years old who has been molested by an uncle who um, has endured significant psychological damage to the point that she's not, she's not able to enter into a relationship with with another man or has a phobia even against that due to what was done to her. And so the lobbying is such that counsel would remain in place that she has the right to go and seek counseling um, just from a, a regular psychologist or from a, a pastor or someone in the religious field today. Unless we as a denomination stand up or seek to preserve our rights, our, 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 our uh, religious liberty rights and on our human rights for the ability to choose, um, we're, we're in grave danger because there are, there are those who have just been running their mouth since the 70s, largely the LGBT militant activists today that are trying to criminalize, um, you know, seeking such help. So while they fought for their right to have a voice and now having obtained that voice, they're now seeking to take the voices of others away from them. And so I, my, I would implore our uh, religious liberty departments at the general conference level, at the North American division level, um, and in every church that I speak to today, I talk to um, members about writing to their um university presidents to their conference presidents. And I think we need to get in, in the business of lobbying uh, before legislators and saying, let's be careful about what moves we make from a legal standpoint. Well, I think you probably need to have uh, someone in leadership, uh, maybe a few people in leadership that need to kind of champion this cause. Um, they need to be um, willing to speak out, whether they're someone from a religious liberty department or whether that would be a pastor. Um, but there needs to be someone, a public voice, 
But then I think perhaps even more important is you need to um, have your members be engaged with the culture. Um, this, this, what's going on in the culture is a lot broader than just this one issue. Um, and we are seeing the whole culture make a big shift. And I think that it's really important that our members actually recognize this and make themselves aware of what's going on and becoming relevant. And then going out there and engaging. You know, I, I have been interested in evangelism for a long time, and I always say evangelism is a contact sport. You have to get out there. You have to meet people. You have to talk to people. And ultimately, I think probably the most important thing is that that personal one-on-one -on -one, um, um, activity. And so while it's important for us to have uh, a good messaging coming from the, from the main leadership of the church, I think at least as important, perhaps more important, is an engaged membership. And they can be engaged in a lot of ways. They can be engaged in, in, uh, in just the people they meet in their local community. And they can also be engaged in, in trying to uh, perhaps uh, write a letter to the legislature or something like that. And so there's, there's just a lot of ways. And I think that a lot of people look at their religion as something that they do where they just come and sit in the pew and then leave and, and they kind of compartmentalize it. Well, I think those days are over. And I think especially as we see the culture make a big shift, um, we're going to have to recognize that we're different and we're different in uh, every way, every day. And I just think we need to be more engaged and, and, and alert. If the culture is uh, moving in this direction, it's kind of like they're moving into, you know, some kind of big artificial flavors. Uh, they didn't like the regular flavor. Now they're in the big artificial flavor. But I think that they're going to find out that these artificial flavors don't bring any dramatic uh, improvements. In fact, you know, people who've gone through some of these surgeries and, and uh, changes, I think a lot of the rates of, of self-harm and things are equally high for people who've gone through them from what I, I'm understanding. So I guess what I'm saying is uh, the culture may be making a big shift, but if the culture is making a big shift and they get to the other, you know, they get to the other side and they find out, well, the grass really isn't very green over here after all. It's just as, just as dead as I thought it was on the other side. I think that does give us some evangelistic opportunities as a church, but if we're not interacting with people, if we're not there to show them, you know, taste, you know, try, try something better, uh, then we'll just, we just add each thing to the list of things that don't work. And we're still in the list of things that don't work, but they won't listen to us. Larry, um, we're, we're kind of in the position of, of uh, cultural indoctrination compromise um, based on, on the Guiding Families book that came out of, of our our denomination at a leadership level that that prescribes that we talk to everyone by the gender that they prefer to be called by and that you're this is fixed being lgbt is fixed you don't need to find a way out because that's just who you are this this book totally promotes lgbt activism within the church that and so a, uh, put out a american division right Yes. And so at a member level, there's confusion. But this was sent out to all of our Adventist educators and to tens of thousands of pastors around the world. And many people now, when we talk to them about going and, and sharing the gospel of Jesus and about redemption of homosexuality, they said, don't worry, I got that. This book that came out has helped me. And so what it does, it just it says that there's no need to seek redemption because God already accepts you as you are. Pastor Daniel. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's a lot to be said on this, isn't there? I think that for a long time now, our church has done very well uh, by camouflaging ourselves and just being invisible. Um, and there are some other churches of similar size that have a very big cultural footprint. Everyone knows about them. In fact, everybody thinks that we're them. People like the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons. Um, people don't even know we exist. And that's been a benefit in many ways because that's, that's helped to shield us from a lot of the kind of controversy. Um, but at the same time, there's going to come a point where if we, if we want to grow, which I think we do, uh, we're going to have to be visible. We're going to have to be seen. And we know from prophecy that there will come a time when we are at the very centre of, of the world's attention. So at, at some point, we're going to have to transition, aren't we? And what we're going to have to get a little bit better, I guess, at engaging with the culture. We're going to have to get better at discussing it and trying to get unity within our church on these issues that 
everyone in the world is talking about right now, but we prefer not to talk about it because that's political, right? Um, so this is, this is a real issue. Uh, how do we as a church get together and say, all right, we know that this has always been considered a political issue, but we need to guide our members. We need to guide our, our pastors. We need to guide... And, and as far as the political, uh, the political side of things, I think it's, it's given us an advantage that our leaders, our church leaders who do already have a role um, in religious liberty, they're able to speak and, and give leadership in that area with some authority because as a church we're not partisan. And I think that's great. We should stay that way. But at the same time, as, as ordinary members, I think we've been encouraging people just to stay out of politics and say it just – it's all evil. It's all wickedness. And Jesus is going to come back anyway. So is that really good enough? You know, we're living our lives here. And, and what is the right way to live our lives? Is it that we should, you know, like you say, call people by their preferred pronoun or should we try to tell people, you know, uh, do we need to argue with people? What's the right way to do it? And I'm not saying I've got the answers. I'm just saying, I think as a church, we can't run away from these issues. We have to actually engage as members, as pastors, as leaders, all of us together, we have to engage and discuss and work out what, what Jesus would want us to do, what the Bible would teach us to do, what's, what God and spirit of prophecy gives us on these issues. Um, and rather than just say, well, that's political, we'll put that to the side and we'll just ignore it. Any closing thoughts, each one of you, uh, looking to the future, looking to the present? I think that, you know, as soon as somebody passes a law that says I can't do something, even if it's something I didn't really want to do or wasn't doing all the time, if I look at it and think, well, that's something I ought to have the right to do and that it's perhaps a, a good thing to, to be doing, um, it makes me want to do it. And I think that when we see these laws being passed, um, it's not a cue for us to be just uh, annoying, but I think it is a cue for us to recognize and to be engaged and so I think that right now, this is a really important time for us to be engaged. And what I've said and, and what is true about religious liberty is that if you don't exercise your religious liberties, they'll take them. And so we really need to be exercising our religious liberties in these issues. And so take, for instance, in Australia, someone needs to test this law. But we also need to be uh, testing this issue in the United States and Canada, everywhere else in the world. Um, just because the freedoms can be encroached upon in a number of, of different ways. And so I would just argue that the people need to to wake up and and be engaged. Yeah, I would I would agree with what Jonathan has said. I, I, something that that is of note here. Um, first, uh, the power of prayer. Do not forget the, that God has this. You know, he has it all the way to the very end. We know we know who wins this battle. It's already been won. Secondly, uh, be engaged, be aware of what is going on, especially when it begins to encroach upon uh, human rights and religious rights. Um, I know of one uh, uh, ministry uh, where the woman from that ministry got involved with uh, the Lafayetteville um, uh, in Indiana was bringing a conversion therapy ban um, to the uh, the city officials there it was put on the on the uh, agenda two nights before it was voted on. And through the help of Pastor Albert Moeller and through John MacArthur, um, there was a call on this for for the community people to be informed as to these accusations and these claims about conversion and reparative therapy. And they were actually able to over overturn the ban before it, it actually got put through. So it was a small victory, but a notable victory um, when people get involved and the, the community came together um, in it with they weren't all of the same denomination. So I think that's something that we need to be aware of, too. Uh, as Adventists, we know, you know, we believe we've had the, the light and the truth for many years, but there are others that can help enhance that light as well um, as, it, as it agrees with Scripture. Um, we need to do everything we can do to preserve religious freedom. Pastor Daniel, the last word. Yeah, uh, Mine would be, uh, Proverbs says, by wisdom, uh, you will fight your own war. And I think as a church, we have a special call. We have a special mission, different from any other church, different from any secular organization. And that's to prepare the world for Jesus to come. So let's use wisdom. 
let's fight our own war, not fight someone else's war. Uh, and I don't mean we, we can look out for, you know, those who are uh, being oppressed. That's, that's not what I'm talking about. I mean, you know, we've got to be careful not to get sucked into a, a political agenda one way or the other. I think we're up and tempted both right and left to do that. Uh, but we need to really pray, watch and pray. Um, we need to spend time studying scripture, maybe even discussing or even maybe debating is not the right word, but you know, sharpening each other as iron sharpens iron so that we, what we're doing is actually going to be the agenda that Jesus has for this world right now. What is it that Jesus really wants us uh, to be talking to people about? Let's talk to them about that. Very good. Well, I want to thank each of you for participating. Uh, Pastor, would you lead us in just a short word of prayer as we conclude? Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much that you love us, that you've saved us by Jesus Christ, who was willing to die for us so that we might have eternal life, but also that we might have victory over sin. And Father, I pray that you would be with each of us here, with Wayne and Jonathan and Larry and and myself, Lord, I pray that you would help us to have wisdom in our different spheres to be able to point others in the right direction. And for all those who have been watching, Lord, thank you for them. And I pray that you would touch their hearts with your spirit and to tell them what they need to do. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. We'll be praying for you in Australia and as long as you pray for us in America. And even if you don't, but I know you won't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, that's right. It, as I said, the law affects you to the same as it does me. So, um, yeah, what starts in Australia often ends up going to other places. So. Yeah. All Watch right. Thank pray. you, each one. Yeah. Goodbye. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Jonathan.